Our expert three, number three, or the speaker number three, is Pat Pleating. He is assistant professor in uh, Zion University. Uh, he is a contemporary media artist. He's an educator, a professional writer, a researcher, expert in argument and virtual reality drones, public speaker, and curator. At TEDx Global Exhibitor, he has written uh, papers, he has written articles. He's a wizard, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, he has so much information, so much intel, so much education to offer when it comes to AR and VR and XR landscape that you can spend days with Patrick and he won't tire him down. Uh, he has been uh, a flag bearer when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the XR landscape here uh, for education sector. Uh, he is managing the XR Center in Sheikh Zayed University and he is always keen to come on board, talk, uh, uh, share his insights, share his very, very valuable two cents. And today he is going to do the same. Welcome back. Thanks, uh, Shujat and uh, the VR AR Association for having me. I'm Patrick Lichty. I'm Assistant Professor of uh, Multimedia and um, Animation at Zayed University in Abu Dhabi, which is where I am right now. And uh, what I'm uh, going to talk about today is um, kind of where I see uh, VR, AR, jobs, that sort of thing going in regards to um, uh, entertainment and the industry in general. So when I was asked this, um, you know, I considered this in terms of my my own practice. In other words, I teach I teach game design at Zayed University to Emirati women, and uh, uh, do some work in uh, psychology and aerospace. And uh, we have a four meter uh, sublime. Um, immersive media portal, which actually runs the uh, Unity and Unreal engines. So uh, to put things in context, let me uh, tell you about some of the things that I was doing until uh, the, um, the pandemic hit. Of, for, of course, first, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a teacher of uh, game design. And so what I was doing is, is that I was teaching the students how to um, consider the idea of making a 3D space and turning that into a narrative using actually Joseph Campbell's uh, notion of the, uh, uh, of the hero's journey and turning it into a three-part plot and expanding that and then putting that into our portal, which I thought was a really interesting idea. The other thing that uh, I was doing with... Um, researchers uh, at, here at Zayed and also at uh, American University of Sharjah is looking at the idea of the um, constructed environment for uh, human beings, a anywhere from, um, you know, the psychology of trying to work in a confined space and then um, creating larger spaces for um, someone to, um, you know, work and play in, um, you know, while working in a much smaller space. In other words, imagine being in your living room for a three, four months, and I don't think that's very hard for us to imagine now, and, you know, putting on your Oculus Quest and imagining yourself, um, you know, walking along the shores of the Black Sea or... Um, you know, going through the meadows of uh, the great Midwest of the United States or, you know, things like The Climb, which I think is a fantastic um, app, as is Google Earth VR. So the thing is, is that with us, what we were thinking about was the idea of how can we, can, how can we deal with um, being in uh, confined spaces for long periods of time and through um, methods of narrative and online space, um, be able to, you know, um, be healthier 
and more productive, you know, and while being confined to smaller spaces through using things like VR. Um, the thing is, is that, of course, uh, we had thought about this for, you know, future Mars missions. Um, uh, a colleague of mine from, uh, a couple colleagues of mine, and I had a uh, presentation together, you know, put together for the uh, Khalifa Space Center, you know, in which you'd be in the Mars base and you'd be um, therapeutically using VR to, um, you know, imagine yourself, you know, in a much larger space. But now, of course, what we can do is that we can just think about this as um, the new uh, situation for the pandemic. So, you know, although things, you know, are getting better, we may consider that there may be additional waves, additional lockdowns. And the one thing that, and other, and, and other pandemics. So the other thing that we want to think about is how VR, XR, and so on can be used in terms of, um, of psychological wellness or productivity, et cetera, to, um, you know, help us through you know, uh, long periods of, of confinement. I mean, we can, um, you know, look at experiments, you know, like the biosphere in the 1970s in the United States, you know, as, as a predecessor for all of this. But what we're looking at is everything from the psychology of Jung to the idea of the recreation of natural spaces and the idea of how we could use things like um, omnidirectional treadmills to try to um, you know, kind of create this, this notion of space, um, you know, that frees someone from a fairly small location. Um, so those are, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we've been doing. Um, the other thing is that, um, I was also asked to consider that, all right, most of us who are speaking are probably going to be in the field for another 10, 15 years. That's about it. And then how about the people who are coming? What do they need? Um, the one thing that I'll wind up saying is that as far as uh, learning is concerned, um, I was a computer engineer at first and um, until I re realized that I needed a graduate degree to be a professor, I, um, ha I had an electrical engineering degree. So, uh, and then I just basically studied with everybody I could, read as much as I could, and learned as much as I could. But um, from a more formal perspective, what advice would I give to students of the future? I would say uh, get going as soon as you can. Um, think about asset creation, anything from textures to 3D objects. Um, and the one thing is, is that, uh, I think really where one niche is going to be extremely important is for, um, specific, uh, bespoke 3d objects. I think that's actually going to be a, a, a big market because there is more and more, there are more and more assets going online and they're getting less and less expensive. Um, secondly, of course, code, uh, where I teach, we are primarily a arts and visual design school. So the thing is, is that um, on, except for our multimedia design program, we don't do a lot of code. Um, so that's why I like Unreal, actually. And um, so delivery methods, um, being that I have about two and a half minutes left, um, I'm thinking that one of the things that I'm really interested in is that what is going to be in the end, kind of a standard for, for um, best practices in hardware. One of the biggest challenges at the moment is that we have so many different headsets. We have so many different options to work from. You know, in AR, we have uh, you know, three or four headsets, including the, the Oculus, uh, I mean, not the Oculus, the HoloLens. And then in VR, really, um, you know, a couple, um, a couple Vives, a couple Oculus, um, you know, just the, the options are just really, really endless. And the, 
So the thing that I think is really probably going to give us a real launch is trying to implement some sorts of uh, hardware standards and um, as with say like the IBM PC. So you have a lot of different um, manufacturers creating, de you know, creating different devices, but all under uh, a set of uh, standardized, um, you know, a, a bunch of standards. So um, with students, I'll go back to that again, is just saying that I think that in general, students uh, need to get going as, as quick as they can, learn some sort of 3D environment, Blender, uh, Unreal, I mean, I mean, Blender, 3D Studio Max, Maya, whatever, I, I, I don't think it really care, yeah, I don't care that much. Um, I think that you learn the principles and if you go into a studio and uh, they have something else, you can pick it up. Uh, I think also another thing that's very interesting is doing parametric design, you know, using program generated design you, with uh, things like um, Rhino and Grasshopper. And then uh, lastly, of course, you know, a good game engine and being able to deploy it on a number of different systems. So that's kind of my thoughts in a nutshell. And I want to thank everybody again for having me, um, you know, on this on this uh, on this panel. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks a lot. Hello, Patrick. Again, time for some questions, some discussions, if we can. I will start with this. What do you think will eventually be a standard platform? Something like with cameras like the Quest, AR glasses like HoloLens, or Apple, or something else. Where do you see this going? When I think about a, what I think is going to be a standard platform, or what I try to theorize as a, as a standard platform, um, I think what I think about is the notion of um, something that can do either VR or AR. In other words, if you think about what we've been seeing as the Apple prototype glasses that are basically almost a transparent sort of sort of glass, but you know, if those glasses could photochromically go dark, um, I think that really a light form factor is going to need to be necessary in order for protracted amounts of time. I, and so I think really the idea of a, um, a, an XR glass that can go opaque is uh, probably going to be the end result. Um, the other thing is that um, if we were going to talk about something like VR, like the Quest, um, I think that if we had something that had, um, you know, the, um, the kind of resolution of the, um, you know, of the Pro or, you know, or whatnot with really high, high res cameras, I think that's probably going to be it. But um, that's kind of, it. or, you know, a really high res wide angle HoloLens too. But the thing is the form factor has got to come down. The resolution has got to go up and it's got to go opaque. Moving on, what do you feel we result in the best and worst case situations for the future of immersive media. In regards to what I think is going to be the best case and worst case scenario for AR, VR, and XR, I think is really going to be completely dependent on um, uh, good interaction human factors design. Uh, the biggest issue that I see is that like the worst case scenario there is a um, art film called Hyper Reality that uh, um, just basically has AR in which um, you know there's a woman in um, who's work doing the gig economy in uh, Colombia, and she's basically just swiping around, getting points while she's doing everything. In other words, like massive, massive multitasking. I think on the other hand. Um, What's going to, uh, I think, maybe just a simplicity of, de of design. If I really sort of like what's what's happening with the, um, um, 
you know, what I see with the Apple prototypes. But I think the one thing that's um, going to be needed, you know, for a um, for spatial computing is just a necessity to um, make sure it is an operating system. It is a desktop platform and that it isn't intruded on by unwanted um, factors. Thank you, Patrick. Last question. And we'll let you go. The biggest obstacle in Linux are development. What is it? Coming from a coming from an academician like yourself, a professor from you, what do you think is the biggest obstacle in Linux in today's scenario? So what do I think is the biggest obstacle in um, the uh, um, expansion of XR, VR, AR? I think really at the moment we're still developing headset technology to the point where we just don't have any standards that are um, really uh, up to the point of making, you know, making them standards. Um, I think this will definitely happen within the next five years. Um, I'm hoping that there will be some standards that start coming about in the next two or three. Uh, the one thing that I am very, very, very heartened by is um, things like the Vive Cosmos and the uh, Oculus Quest. And, um, you know, things that are really easy to set up your uh, guardian boundaries easy to do, uh, easy to develop for but of course you know with anything in its early stages um, you know we have um, technological limitations as far as optics and um, processing so um, that'll come along and um, I think I think we'll be in very serviceable shape in about uh, maybe two three years. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks a lot for doing this for us. We hope to see you again in the near future. Have a lovely day. Thank you.